Hello, Wayne here. Uh, this is part two of the five-part series, Freed to Kill, the Burn Stick Killer. Uh, like I said on the first one, uh, viewer discretion is strongly advised. I know it says that on the screen, but I, I like to put that out there. So enjoy the show, and I'm going to get out of here and let you guys watch it. Bye. Kenneth McDuff had been convicted of the broomstick murders. A Dallas jury convicted McDuff of shooting the two boys in the head, repeatedly raping Louise Sullivan and choking her to death with a broomstick. And he is sentenced to die in the Texas electric chair, which in those days was known as Old Sparky. But that's not gonna happen. He's gonna escape his death with the executioner. Because of events taking place more than a thousand miles away in Washington, D.C. The most important dateline tonight is the Supreme Court. A sharply divided court today ruled five to four that the death penalty is illegal in the form in which it is generally used today. This will have an immediate effect on the lives of 600 men and women who have been awaiting execution in 31 states. And then in 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the death penalty in a decision called Furman versus Georgia. In Texas, that meant that everybody on death row, including Kenneth McDuff, who's awaiting his date with the electric chair, their sentences are commuted to life. And now they're eligible for parole. Now the chair probably will become a relic of the past. This is Don McClellan, WSB News. I'm sure when the Supreme Court issued Furman versus Georgia in 1972, it occurred to no one that these people who have been convicted of murder, who have been placed on death row, would one day get out. After getting off of death row, and now his sentence is life, Kenneth McDuff's eligible for parole. Well, he is denied parole 14 consecutive times. Finally, in October of 1989, 23 years after Kenneth McDuff has been sentenced to die in the electric chair for the broomstick murders, McDuff walks out of prison on parole, a free man off a death row out of the maximum security unit. Couldn't believe it. I said, how did he get out on parole? After the, the murders that he had already committed, he beat the death penalty. Something's wrong here. A guy who murders three juveniles and rapes the one female, you know, I mean, that guy shouldn't be walking among us. We know what he had done in the 60s in Fort Worth, Texas near that baseball field. He was known as the broomstick killer. And now, with McDuff out on the streets again, Melissa Northrop, the pregnant mother of two young children, has just vanished into the dead of night, abducted from the convenience store in Waco, a quick pack. Now, we don't have all the facts, but we're morally convinced we have most likely a serial killer on our hands we must do something.
In March 1992, Kenneth McDuff is out of prison, his whereabouts unknown, and a posse of three lawmen, Prosecutor Bill Johnston and U.S. Marshals Mike and Parnell McNamara, fear McDuff may have killed a gang. They are determined to find him. The boys from Waco, as I call them, are three guys who probably should have been born 100 years ago. They have that moral compass of uncompromising views of what is right and what is wrong. They hear Kenneth McDuff is on the loose, and we have a convenience store clerk who's missing. His car was found near the scene of the crime. Other people may or may not have been dragging their feet. Those three boys went out there, and they hit the road. When we got that warrant, we formed up a plan to try to find everyone that ran around with McDuff, his friends, his associates, his criminal associates, and so forth. And that wasn't going to happen from 9 to 5. Those people didn't wake up till 5. You had to be willing to wait till midnight or so to see him stirring ground and find him. You're not at the Ritz-Carlton. You're probably at the worst hotels, the worst bars, the worst hangouts, the back alleys, where the prostitutes are active, where the drug dealers are peddling. Federal Prosecutor Bill Johnson and the McNamara's literally are trolling through the trash of Central Texas, the worst of the worst of ex-cons. They're rousting and beating up crack dealers. They've got prostitutes. I mean, it really is a slimy world. And that's where McDuff lived and ran. And those were his friends from prison. Justification for my presence was we'd be interviewing witnesses, which might help prove one or more crimes, which could be federal offenses. I did this because I'd seen my father, a state prosecutor, go out with the Dallas County Sheriff off and on. And, you know, I knew that that was commitment versus just having a job. My dad prosecuted all kinds of cases and was involved in the Jack Ruby case and several others. My mom died when I was seven. I idolized my father. But when I was 17, something happened. I worked in a grocery store in Dallas. One night, I was supposed to be working. And my store was robbed at gunpoint by a meth freak who killed one of our employees, who shot who I would have been. It frightened me. But somewhere in my frightened little person began to burn a desire to stop people from being violent to each other. And what McDuff did to those kids in Fort Worth, go get McDuff. The chance to try to catch a serial killer? Oh my gosh. Who would not, as a law enforcement person or a prosecutor, want the chance to keep someone from killing someone else? Prosecutor Bill Johnston and U.S. Marshals Parnell and Mike McNamara aren't the only people looking for serial killer Kenneth Allen McDowell. On March 3rd, just days after Melissa Northrop has disappeared, Kenneth McDuff's mother, Addie McDuff, known as the Pistol Packing Mama, files a missing persons report with the Bell County Sheriff's Office, which is located just south of Waco. This report lands on the desk of criminal investigator Tim Steglich. I received a missing person report on Kenneth Allen McDuff. And so I ran his criminal history and determined that he had been paroled on a 1966 
triple murder. It's not uncommon for people that are on parole to take off and have someone report them as a missing person. This is an old scam. If you're going to run, if you're going to break parole and bust out, you'll always have a family member call in and say you've disappeared. And you just hope the police will believe that you're dead. This is the old McDuff house. So I drove out here to speak with Addie McDuff about her missing son. I started asking Miss McDuff some questions. Mr. McDuff was seated in the living room. She kept alluding to the fact that she was afraid he was dead. I just thought that was not an appropriate response within a couple of days of somebody going missing. Almost like she had been coached into saying something like that. Addie McDuff was doing 90% of the talking. I had to direct everything toward her, because if Mr. McDuff started talking, she usually cut him off. She was just loud and obnoxious. When you go to the, the FBI's profiling school, one of the things they tell you about is that a lot of these sexually sadistic serial killers, their mother is incredibly overbearing. She's the poster mom for serial killer's mom. I asked her to show me around the house to see if I could find anything that might indicate what happened to her son. I'm directed to Kenneth McDuff's room. I find cowboy boots, evidence that he was attending Texas State Technical in Waco, probably doing a lot of metalworking that he had learned in prison. There was a red pickup in the garage. The uh, pickup had a broken windshield on the right side, passenger side. And I'm being pretty guarded. Kenneth had a history of extreme violence. Making sure to keep my back to the wall and watch, although I was reasonably sure he wasn't there, she wouldn't have reported him missing in the first place. Kenneth McDuff had been charged with a triple murder in 1966. However, he paroled in 1989. When I see a history like that, then I know there may be more, and maybe a whole lot more, to the reason a person went missing. When I arrived here at the Texas State Capitol in 1990, Texas was literally awash in blood. There was a violent crime wave sweeping across Texas. It was splashed across the headlines. Buried in the story is that it was committed by violent inmates out on early parole. And I began asking, how could this be happening? There was no such thing in the state at that time as life without parole. Moreover, because of prison overcrowding, there's a perfect storm going on here. I wouldn't cage a dog up like they got us caged up right now. Texas needed to build more prisons. Not just a little bit more, a lot more. For years, the state defied federal orders to expand the prison system. They didn't want to raise taxes. At the same time, those same members of the legislature are talking tough on crime. So they're instituting longer sentences, but there's no place to keep these people for a long time. I needed to start digging, digging for answers. I arrived at the state capitol to cover the legislature, and it was in session to cover state government. But in the background, I'm starting to dig about what's going on there. They're in this sea of crime, violent crime taking place. And I don't think they pause to say, what? what's behind this? Nobody seemed to be paying attention except Senator Ted Lyon. He was the chairman of the Criminal Justice Committee. One day, I'm summoned urgently to his office. He's shaking in anger. 
He has a list of more than 60 former death row inmates who've been released on parole, McDuff among them. But at the top of the list of his concerns is an inmate named Leonardo Lopez. Lopez and his accomplice had taken five deputies in Dallas hostage and killed three of them. Lyon was especially angry about it because before he went to law school and was elected to the Texas legislature, he'd been a patrol officer in a suburb of Dallas and he had served warrants with one of the slain deputies. So this was personal. Fast forward, and I'm the chairman of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, and I find out that they had just paroled Leonardo Lopez, who had been convicted of killing three officers, not just killing them in a gunfight, executing them, having them on their knees and shooting them. Couldn't believe it. I was so upset. I needed somebody that was an ally in the press to go and champion this. And he says to me, you know, here's the list, you have to do this story. The parole of police killer Leonardo Lopez outraged the Senate Criminal Justice Committee. Texas Senator Ted Lyon, who I do a story, and the story sends a shockwave through the state. Department of Criminal Justice. Overnight, every sheriff in the state of Texas is calling the governor. The outrage that hit in the wake of it, Senator Lyon called here and he called to the Capitol the parole board members who had voted to release Leonardo Lopez, the cop killer, to demand an explanation. It was right here on the Senate floor. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. These former, quote, conservative folks saying, they are raping the bottom of the barrel, Senator. We must let these people go every day. We must let these people go. We have no choice, Senator. It was a fiery hearing. Senator Lyon at times was yelling at them. And how many people would he have to kill before you wouldn't let him out? Crude as it might be, Senator, you know we cannot keep everyone. If we see 10 people, we're letting eight of them go, Senator. What came out in the hearing, though, that just rocked the world was that under fire from Lyon, one of the parole board members suddenly tells the truth. They have been releasing 150 inmates a day, 750 a week. In the beginning, they were putting the hot check riders out, drug offenses, car thieves, but now they were scraping the bottom of the barrel and on that bottom of the barrel was Kenneth Allen McDuff. They can let out 100 people a day, which is what they were doing, but they don't have to let out murderers and rapists and people that kill police officers. Senator Lyon had James Granberry, the parole board chairman, testify. Granberry had been a Republican candidate for governor in the state of Texas. He was making all these decisions about criminal justice. Who gets out of prison in Texas? Today we want to look at the specific. Senator Lyon grills Granberry. I mean, skewers him in this Senate hearing. Granberry defends it and he says, we don't have crystal balls. We we're doing the best job we thought. They were model prisoners. He has no moral objection at all. He's hoping whatever has happened will go away. And I thought, there is something wrong here. What else are they lying about? What else are they hiding from the public? So I started digging, sifting through the list. There's one person that stands out. Kenneth Allen McDuff. McDuff had committed three murders, and no one would ever imagine that he would get out on parole, yet that's exactly what happened. He was paroled in 1989, and the news came as a complete shock to the family of Robert Brand, one of the three teenagers that McDuff murdered 23 years earlier in 1966. When he got out, was paroled, 
Mother called me and she said, your dad, he's got his gun, he's on the way to Rosebud. He was gonna try and find him and end it. And I went all the way around that McDuff's home down there, boy. I mean, I had plenty of guns, plenty of ammunition, and I had plenty of time to do it. I've never seen a living so long time I was down there. Sheriff Paplin, merciful man, he caught me and took all my guns away from me and sent me home. We didn't know he got out but until he came to Rosebud. One day, Kenneth McDuff comes to the convenience store where we always go every Saturday morning to have coffee. He walks in and the owner waits on him and comes back and says, did you know who that was? And we said, no, who was that? And he said, that's Kenneth McDuff. He got out of prison. My daughter was out running practice for track meet. My wife ran out immediately and hollered at her and told her, get in the house, Mac Duff is a loose, Mac Duff is a loose. And I slept with a loaded shotgun by the bedside. It terrorized people. Everybody was carrying a knife or scissors in the car at night, even my wife. McDuff had been warned to stay away from Rosebud because those people were afraid of him. They didn't want to see him. They didn't want him around. And yet, he decided to go there. He's sitting on a sidewalk, and a few young black males are walking, minding their own business. He got up and started talking, talking trash to him. He said, you little black SOBs, you uh, y'all think you own the world. Well, you don't. He said, and I'm here to tell you you don't. Well, he pulls out a knife, and he's following these kids, acting like he's going to hurt them. He pissed me off. Uh, those kids weren't bothering nobody. And I told him, you know, we didn't do that around here, and we didn't tolerate it. And I told him he put his knife in his pocket and leave. It's reported, he's arrested, his parole is revoked. He is sent back to the penitentiary. In 1990, the panel votes to parole McDuff again. The fact that they let him out, not once but twice, there is no excuse for that. I mean, in Rosebud, people all were talking about that maybe Miss McDuff paid somebody off. She had the money and she paid somebody off. Your faith in the system is shaken. On December 18, 1990, Kenneth McDuff is once more put on the street, free to kill. When McDuff got out of prison on parole, he, like many, many other these ex-cons, they're playing the game. They're really trying to con their parole officers. They're trying to show that they're doing the right things and what they should be doing. So McDuff enrolled in a trade school. McDuff saw it as an opportunity to get a place to live, a place to go, an allowance, and access to young people that he can easily intimidate. McDuff had spent most of his life behind bars in prison in Texas, so that when he came out in his early 40s, he had the emotional maturity of when he had gone into the prison. It's arrested adolescence. It is incredible to believe this, but he actually made the dean's list on one of the semesters he attended. And his mama was very, very proud, and she talked about how he was devoted to becoming the mechanic he was supposed to be studying for. Then during that time period in May of 1991, he got a night job, the graveyard shift, at a convenience store called the Quick Pack. He's working beside a man who is married to Melissa Northrop, another convenience store clerk, who will disappear from her shift almost a year later. 
And she was really nice to him. I mean, she would even pack an extra sandwich. She would give him snacks or a sandwich or something like that. He brags about everything. He could rob any kind of convenience store he wanted to because he worked at one. He understood that there was no security at these places to speak of. There was one young lady in one of those quick packs, Melissa Northrup, a real good-looking young woman. He bragged that he could just take her anytime he wanted to. He was a natural predator. That, that was his way. He, he was on the hunt all the time. McDuff spends his evenings cruising the Interstate 35 corridor, looking for drug dealers to rob. He's always bragging about he's going to take down crack dealers, steal their drugs and money. He's also cruising a place in Waco called The Cut. It's just right off Interstate 35. It was an open-air drug market, an open-air sex market, 24-7. And he came here looking for prostitutes that he could easily pick up. They were transient. Nobody would miss them. They would get in a pickup truck with McDuff. And it was the last ride they would ever take. In October 1989, at least one day after McDuff walks out of prison on parole, a free man, investigators say he killed his first victim, an African-American sex worker named Seraphia Parker. From then on, up and down Interstate 35, bodies are going to start showing up. Thompson was a prostitute in that area of Waco. Brenda got in with McDuff. However, something happened pretty quickly. Brenda, through intuition, knew something, and she wanted out. He was huge, and his hands were massive. He could probably kill someone in five seconds. Brenda wanted out of that truck. Brenda Thompson had told her fellow sex workers that if she thought she was ever going to be attacked, she would fight like hell, try to kick the windshield out. She told everybody that. He was in complete control, and she could do nothing about it. All she could do was kick at the windshield. McDuff came upon a Waco police barricade. They saw Brenda Thompson kicking the windshield of the truck. McDuff continued on, went the wrong way down a one-way street. Turns his lights out with Brenda Thompson still screaming. She didn't want to be there. She couldn't get out. And she didn't. She didn't get out. She never got out. And it's been disputed how persistent the police were in chasing him, or if they just wrote it off. It's another sex worker in a dispute with a John. McDuff was living a double life, enrolled in the Texas State Technical College, where he claimed to be studying to be a welder. Well, all the time he's cruising the cut, looking for the sex workers here that he could snatch, rape, and murder. They started looking at the number of women that were missing, and that Macduff was possibly a part of. And it was a big number. It was a dozen or so that they could not account for.
I was on the trail of trying to uncover how all of these violent inmates plus death row inmates were getting paroled. Then I got a tip from law enforcement sources that the U.S. Marshals in Waco were searching for triple killer Kenneth McDuff. They think that he is the prime suspect in the abduction of Melissa Northrup, who disappeared in the middle of the night from a Waco convenience store. Waco police suspect that McDuff killed a... So I break a story, and boy, does that shake things loose. His old cellmate says McDuff randomly abducts any female that appears vulnerable. Vince, uh, Waco police suspect that McDuff My story airs on the 10 o'clock news. The next morning, my phone rings. It's Barbara Carpenter. She tells me, I saw the man who murdered my daughter in your newscast last night. She goes on to explain that her daughter, Regina Moore, a sex worker, was last seen alive with Kenneth McDuff in his pickup and that she had gone to the Waco Police Department. No one really would pay attention to her. I immediately got my crew, and we highballed it to Waco. Barbara was a truck stop waitress. We talked to her there. She tells me that months earlier, she and her husband went out to the Texas State Technical College, where McDuff was supposed to be attending trade school, and confronted her. And she said that when she and her husband arrived, there was his red pickup truck with the windshield kicked out. This is the same truck where Brenda Thompson was last seen kicking and frantically fighting for her life. And there it sits. Her husband met us and we went to the dormitory to his room and heard the full account of what she had seen back then. They confront him about her daughter, Regina Moore, and tell him she was last seen with you. Threw his hands up in the air and started hollering. Don't pin this on me. Don't pin this on me. A demeanor came over him that frightened him. And when I saw him in that room, I knew he killed my daughter. I talked to students that knew him. And then one tells me, McDuff talked to me about abducting a convenience store clerk and he talked about wanting to kill women. They all thought he was a diabolical, crazy person. Nobody ever reported it to the school. Nobody ever raised the issue with police because they were all afraid of him. And they were scared to death. Barbara Carpenter was telling me, I've been to the police and they wouldn't really listen. That's not right. She tells me the only person that is listening to me is Bill Johnston and two U.S. Marshals. That's it. Nobody else has paid attention to me. While the McNamara brothers and Bill Johnston are beating the bushes around Waco for any trace of Kenneth McDuff, one hundred miles south, down Interstate 35. In the Texas state capital of Austin, it's still reeling from two unsolved crimes of its own. The city of Austin was once a quaint college town. In the 1990s, most people considered it safe, a good place to be living. And there was a lot of freedom. There was a sense of fun. There was a sense of safety. You didn't feel threatened. And very suddenly, the headlines changed. 
It's considered one of the most violent crimes Austin has ever seen. Four teenage girls shot, then left to burn in a deliberate fire. There's a fire at a yogurt shop late at night in an affluent strip mall in northern Austin. And the firefighters discover the bodies of four young ladies. It was stunning. The yogurt shop murder happened where families shopped not too far from the news station where I work, and it was a crime scene where four teenagers had been murdered, and it was a difficult, difficult thing to cover. There was fear because the perpetrators were so violent. Their victims were children, and for that to happen in Austin was unbelievable. Everybody has children, you know, teenage kids, so that hit home with a lot of people. Then in late December, another incident occurs that was a shock to the community. My brother and I were driving my car. He was in the driver's seat. I was in the passenger seat. We wanted to take a left turn on the Powell at one-way street heading uh, towards 5th Street. As we were about to make that turn, we realized the car was coming the wrong way on Powell, trying to get from 5th Street to 6th Street. As we approached and stopped at that intersection, waiting for that car to clear, that car stopped at that same intersection. The passenger and the driver leaned forward into the windshield of the car, looking left and right, to try to figure out what to do next. And that lasted several seconds, and they obviously were lost. So they finally decided to take a left on 6th Street in front of us. My brother and I arrived at our destination on Powell. Within a minute or two of us standing there on the porch, we heard a scream coming from somewhere around the car wash that was across Powell Street, just on 5th Street. We saw a car immediately pull out of the car wash and take a hesitant right turn, going the wrong way, going west instead of east on a one-way street east. So I knew immediately it was the same car we had run into before because they were driving as erratically and indecisively as the other car was. Call the police. There's been an abduction, it looks like. We all walked down at that point to the car wash waiting for the police, and we saw the car uh, in the stall that was being freshly washed, abandoned with the door slightly ajar and no one else in sight. When I saw the fresh white suds sitting on the car, that's when I knew something really bad had happened. And when they investigated it, the woman's purse was in the car. We didn't know where she was. It was an abduction, a kidnapping. The victim was identified as 28-year-old Colleen Reed. I learned that Colleen was missing on Monday morning. I was working for the city of Austin at the time. Oliver, her boyfriend, fiance, called the office. And he asked me, do you know where Colleen is? And I, I laughed and said, it's Monday morning. She's at work. He was the one who told me that something had happened and Colleen was missing. It was just so chilling because the things were so ordinary. The activity, what she was doing, everything about it was so ordinary. It could have been anyone that you know and love. When that information was released to the public that next day, it was another layer of panic for the, the citizens. What's going on in this city? All of a sudden, crime is going crazy, and we don't know who's doing it, why they're doing it. One of the most difficult things I've ever done in my life was tell my parents that Colleen was missing. We didn't know where she was. <laughs> <laughs>